Hello, Perfume Nation. Welcome. Welcome to the next installment of our podcast where we talk about the highs and the lows, the beauty, the paragons, the mysteries and the perils of being part of this delightful global community. Today, we're going to tap into the the most cliche, the most deep, the most shallow, the most pressing and the most tiresome topic of all when it comes to the perfume community. What is the sexiest scent? Why do we even bother with this question? If you look at the most watched videos on any YouTube channel or any podcast related to fragrances, scents in general, you will just be bombarded with the realization that is a very exponential decay of interest, regardless of which gender is watching with respect to what gender of interest. It is how to get laid by spritzing this 10,000 times. That's pretty much like where, it, where, where, where the top hits are. Then we get into like a very sharply decaying interest when, talks to, when we're talking about demure, seductive, complimentary, delightful, soothing, yummy, um, comforting scents. And that's just all a somewhat flirtatious linguistic way to disguise the question number one and the rest does not matter. So let's attack the topic, shall we? We'll talk about why do we even need to smell sexiness because there is a lot to be said of using our olfactory system as it was given to us by universe without actually having a sensation of smelling anything at all. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get to the most delicious part of the podcast intro, the Perfume Nation song. While you're enjoying this snazzy, soulful little rhythm, click on the like, click on the subscribe, share on social media and move. Just move a little bit. It's good for you. Trust me. It's good for you. Welcome to the show, fantasy, take it slow You tune just in time to join the flow Welcome to the hype, where since come alive Where knowledge and laughter find side by side Perfume Nation is the place where we dive Exploring the sense and the stories they drive we're glad that you came, just jump in the game Where we unveil secrets behind fragrances fame Welcome to Perfect Nation, we're glad you are here Join our journey, and this you're here So let's start the show, give us a cheer Welcome to Perfect Nation, we're glad you are here Oh boy, that is one of the best songs I've ever created to date, which was two days ago. Anyway, Seximus, good God. Uh, the number of times where I felt disgusted by this question, tired, exhilarated, exhausted, bored, I, I lost count. I lost count. You ask any blogger, perfume blogger, reviewer on the planet, what is the most watched content, what is the most asked question, and what is the most fruitless question to ask, that will be this one. And it seems that people can have enough. Uh, I, like, I subscribe to a lot of YouTube channels. It's mostly where this content lives at this time. There's a lot of short form content in other social media, but you know, YouTube is pretty much where most substantial content lives about fragrances and scents. And you will just you will just see the exponential decline in interest. You soared by the most watch, and it's going to be what's the sexiest perfume. Every blogger uh, shed a lot of tears, said a lot of words on the topic. First and foremost, I think we are to validate at least the basic premise. It is factually true that olfactive system is involved very closely, closer than any other sense or sensing mechanism that we have, visual, auditory, 
I don't know about haptic. I think haptic is pretty close to subconscious. But olfactive is either just close second or as close to the influencing of our subconscious and of our systems of arousal, fight or flight responses closer than any other. So it's true. And again, subjectively, empirically, in real life, in our real pedestrian life, we all know this. It is true. We're constantly affected by sense. They do act as agents of a lot of information, not only emotional and primitive, such as arousal, but also a lot of coded exchanges of status, of friend or foe, of safety versus danger, of health versus sickness. So it is, there is a real fundamental, if you wish, evolutionary basis why we're constantly asking this question of sense or anything that can, we can smell. And if it was as easy as the smell of a vanilla to solve the problem, it would be solved. There would not be a huge industry around it, right? Like you would just use it same as aspirins. Like, yep, yeah, I want to get late tonight. So here is the vanilla extract. Here we go on all the all the points that emit the most odor, like have warmth. Uh, if like if there's a specifically genetically modified vanilla that we needed in order to be combined with our biome, that's actually what pro pro produces a lot of our smell. That mixed, if there was a known agent or so-called pheromone, the problem would be fixed, right? It's not fixed. There's a reason. There's probably a death by a thousand cuts why this question is constantly asked because it's valid to ask that question of the olfactory system specifically. And yet it's not solved. I think one of the most interesting parts that I want to dive in right now, and we can circle around and cover other factors, is the olfactive system, as we know it, is the most ancient sensing signaling mechanism for organic life because it is literally chemical binding. That's like the most primitive and yet the most fundamental way life as we define it on earth, organic life, transmits information and reacts to environment. True, right? Seems pretty simple. However, there's an interesting twist. When we were evolving as or organisms, we developed other types of sensing, auditory, visual. Now there is finally some emergent science that we actually, or at least not all of us, but some of us have a bit of a heightened sensitivity to electromagnetic fields. So there is, there's a lot that we can sense that is not necessarily chemical binding olfactory. Olfactory probably also often links with taste buds, but there are only four types of taste receptors, if I'm not mistaken. So tasting is actually very, even more primitive and not as diverse of a spectrum as smelling. That said, first of all, a lot of sensing systems developed alongside olfactory that are affected, like why we have two nostrils, we have two eyes, all of that stuff, our sensing uh, radars and equipment, the tools, they often come in pairs or at least divided symmetrically into halves or parts because we need to detect differences in average between, you know, pointed stimulation. Fine, all sensing systems share that in common. And actually, we smell differently from each nostril. If you haven't conducted those experiments at home, have fun. You can do it with food. You can do it with anything that emits a noticeable smell. Do it together with friends and family. You'll have a lot of fun. You'll like, if you focus enough, you will feel that you're smelling differently depending on which nostril you block and which one you use to smell. Anyway, those sensing systems have started to kind of overwhelm and override our olfactory system. So one of its really mysterious properties when you compare it to others, for example, auditory, it's many to many. It's all these stereocilia, all these vibrations, all these signal pathways. And when I say many to many, I mean it's like it's complex on the bottom, it's complex on the top. Olfactory system is many to one or 
more correctly, many to few. We have hundreds, 300 or more types of receptors, olfactory receptors. So like think about like where, where the journey starts. The chemicals come in into our nose through the mucus. They uh, start being transported to the receptors. So we have different types and that's hundreds. Dogs obviously have more, but we have plenty. We are actually very olfactively active and nuanced animal species. So we have many types. Each type can bind to a lot of different molecules and there is like many to many relationship with things that we sense and which parts of our sensing on kind of on the field, right? Like on the ground, which part of the receptors, what they can interact with. So there's many to many complexity there. But then once it gets to a signaling stage, it goes from like think of combinations, millions, billions combinations of things then to just a few in the pro final processing in the brain. It's just such a dramatic reduction of complexity, complexity, dimensionality. Once you get sort of the parts of the brain that are analyzing and making decisions, making judgments, if you wish. Why? It is a delicious puzzle that no real researcher will ever tell you they know an answer to because this is just such a bewildering kind of degeneracy. Not only that, so we're so complex on the ground, but up here, after everything was processed, activated, interacted with, its, with, with itself in many, many different ways, we get this super duper simplified reductionist signal that goes into the processing stage. Not only that, but then it's easily, easily overridden by visual and auditory cues, especially visual. Visual cues nearly dominate the decision making and kind of like what we think is going on, how we perceive reality. There, there are many studies that show, you know, like I think it was about orange juice, the most famous one that's quoted. If you color a liquid like orange juice, it's orange. No matter how it smells, most likely people say it's an orange juice, even if it's not. So we're very easily duped. So we have this most sophisticated machinery and mechanisms and processes. And yet there's some reason or many reasons why at the end of the day this system is very fast it's only two synapses removed from the limbic brain it is as close as it gets to subconscious this is why i keep saying that using smells is very important for mood regulation for working with your memory i'm not saying that it's obvious how to but it is important, it's clear, it's clear by the way it's positioned so close to our, um, to our sympathetic systems that it is very potent. So complex sensing, extreme abstraction and reductionism, and then it gets shot straight to the subconscious, like boom. No other sense can do that. Smelling can. Which, again, justifies the question. Yeah, if we're talking about arousal, if we're talking about liking someone, feeling attracted to them, in some, I would say, primitive way, right? Not necessarily in a complex societal or psychological way where you have a lot in common, that your conversation flows easily, that you know, a person comes with resources and or you can build something together and it's clear to you that you collaborate really well. Very important for the whole question of relationship building. But when it comes to like, how does olfactory system play a role in it? Does it play a role? And is it important? The answer to is yes and yes. The, the question to how like, how do you hack it? How do you make everyone love you? Just like in that proverbial perfumer book. There's no answer. <laughs> There's almost no answer to this day. And I think some of the complexity lies not only in the bias and what, what research gets funded, like what, because a lot of the even independent academic research gets funding 
from sources based on some kind of a demand, even if it's a government grant, there still has to be some kind of justifiable demand to fund any given research. And often things of kind of uh, overall interesting to know or societal value that have that cannot be monetized, they cannot be patented, right? Those don't get a lot of funding. So there might be an effect there that we're just not, we don't know the answer because we're, we're not really investing on a large scale as governments because governments have the most money. Like it's very, it will be hard to find any private company that can actually pull it off rather than maybe the top tech companies. And I know that Google has been behind doors trying to crack the question of digitizing smells. Uh, They haven't succeeded yet. And I hope they won't. Like part of me hopes they do, but a part of me really hopes they don't because that's why how I arrived at olfactory design because that was one of the very things left to us as humans in the in the new age of everything being digital and, and us being progressively more and more removed from ourselves and removed from physical reality. Anyway, okay, another tangent. I'm full of tangents, if you didn't notice. Everything that we know about olfactory system is bewilderingly contradictory and cleanly self-evidently important. And that brings us to the proverbial and much controversial notion of pheromones. I don't think any amount of podcasts from me, from anyone else, perfumers, labs, academical institutions or other more influential bloggers than I am right now will really make a dent in the market of smelling perfumes with pheromones. In a way, I'm happy that people are capable of making a coin out of of thin air. Uh, That said, it is as close as it gets to scamming. Here is why. First and foremost, a very rotten definition of the word pheromones as a agents responsible for mating response and almost like a signaling systems uh, for mate selection as a term and as a type of a chemical right it's a type of mo- molecule or a collection of molecules that are thought to be genetically controlled mostly though the environment plays a role too those that emerge over a century ago in <laughs> the drums in insect studies bacterial and insect studies do pose very interesting fundamental question about how li- life on earth does anything how anything gets done sensing interactions it's all like all and great but they just don't translate directly to the human behavior and human genome. And these constant constant traversing between rodents to yeast to rodents to some other type of uh, a life form and then back to humans is a very convoluted and difficult path even for seasoned researchers. The best we know how to trace kind of similarities between uh, animal kingdoms is to see uh, if there is a known genetic pathway. Let's say we know which genes are responsible for production of proteins, the proteins that will make those molecules. We try to see across all the lineages of animals how well are those genes preserved. It's like a conservative um, production of them, meaning they're more or less the same. They act about the same. Their diversity is about the same. So, right? so that means that this way of coding information is very, very conservative and very likely to work the same way in humans as it does in insects. Well, it doesn't. It does not. <laughs> the notion of pheromones where an insect literally chemically senses a trail left by another insect and follows that chemical path in order to find a mate and then copulate and then produce offspring, that does not work in humans. 
We just don't function in that obvious way. Not only to mention that all of this, most of the olf olfaction studies when it comes to mating, so to speak, is done through a rather unattractive smell, such as urine, semen, all kinds of production uh, out of our glands in that, you know, in the reproductive organs, uh, and uh, the BO, so-called BO, body odors. Those are nearly, not 100%, but nearly universally are considered to be unpleasant smells if you can detect them. There is a variety. We do tend to become friends with people who have similar body odor to ours. Interesting set of studies. That said, for mating response, we usually go for genetic diversity. So what does it say about smells? Not entirely clear in terms of body odor, but also when we're, when we're bringing it bringing it all the way back to perfume nation when we're using perfume we're either altering or masking our natural body odor right so in a way we're disrupting our if if there are any mating uh, trails that we <laughs> create in the air by using perfume we're actually disrupting masking and deceiving each other to how we actually smell and whether we are or, or not a good good match for each other if we if you're using perfume in that context that by itself kind of puts the whole question question of what kind of boozy vanilla should i put on so i am delicious and irresistible to all men out there versus like what kind of uh, oceanic spicy wood do i need to put on myself as a male in order to women just like start undressing as soon as they enter the room where I am um, that by itself becomes kind of a joke right like if if the most functional molecules when it comes to animal mating responses are the the, the literally the you know the, the the molecules that are contained in discharge various bodily dischargers then uh, not wearing a perfume is your best option, but then you're going to smell of BO and of those dischargers. Um, actually, that we, as, as a civilization, we did live in that era before the invention of hygiene and certain religious influences that were kind of fighting against our animal natures, Puritanism and many others that had a huge um, effect on the way that we perceived smells and whether we wanted to smell of anything or of what we wanted to smell like. So all of those cultural codes kind of intervened in the way that we, what we think now we should smell like, because in medieval times, fun, fun fact, knights uh, often would send parcels and messages to their dames, to, to, to their, I don't know how to call them, loved ones, their uh, asking them to uh, send uh, very heavily worn pieces of clothing so they could kind of like indulge in smelling their woman when they were out there uh, killing, murdering or whatever they were doing in those wars. Also, there was a, a, a selection of mates based on also smelling their armpits, smelling the clothes that have been worn. And if, again, a quick reminder, in medieval ages, we didn't have hygiene as we know it now. People didn't really bathe. Most of the perfumery arose from medicine, medicinal chemistry. And often it was to repel the smells of sickness, death and decay. So in a way, perfumes are the enemies of sexual arousal. If you really, really want to go down there, if you want to get real, perfumes are distracting and masking the, the potential smells that we emit already that are involved in these uh, rituals, in the mating rituals. That's the first point kind of against 
uh, our favorite subject. The second point, it's isn't that lovely how I first like spend half an hour validating the question and then <laughs> and then I spend the, the next half an hour negating it. Uh, welcome, well, welcome to the scientific approach to to discourse. Mm, the second a rather intriguing question that just keeps me awake at night a, a lot of a lot of the nights. And I, I wonder if you guys have any opinion on that or any information is that actually it turns out that our olfactory system is fully capable of doing the whole thing, binding, signaling, processing, making decisions without producing an awareness of scent. There are molecules that have no discernible scent to us. So when you're smelling some kind of solution with it, you will not smell anything. And it's not a question of anosmia or some kind of deviation of you having long COVID. No, literally no one really smells those molecules. No one. They have no real discernible smell. Yet they do bind, they go through the whole cycle through and they're dependent on all faction systems. And that has been proven for a few molecules, not for many, but because it's a very, very expensive, a long research process to prove uh, this pathway per molecule or per agent, so to speak. Mm, but we do know that there are some really potent mm, reactions that we have in our brain, in our emotions, in our subconscious, and even in our behavior without actually experiencing a smell. This just broke me, to be honest, because just like a lot of philosophers now argue that experience of self, right, consciousness, knowing that you exist, being aware of your own existence is a byproduct of brain function. And you actually, your body, you as a human, don't necessarily need consciousness, soul, if you wish awareness of self in order to be perfectly healthy animal and go through life and function you can be so to speak in a biological machine that is not aware of itself has no consciousness has no soul and you'll be just fine uh, observation wise health wise functioning wise you're gonna be just fine the same it turns out works with our olfactive systems the system can work and produce no experience that you can detect as if you're smelling something you will have no experience of sending am i smelling something do i like what i smell do i not like what i smell as i said the previous one i gave you all these bodily discharges we do almost universally there are a few exceptions there are certain kinds of people that truly indulge in the smell of feces bo urine and that kind of stuff they are rare. Most often, we do not like that smell. Like most of the time, people agree they do not like them. So, so we do smell them, but we don't like it. But they are important for mating selection. And the third one, this is the one that just breaks my brain. It just breaks me. That there are molecules that are important for our emotional and behavioral life and our affect our subconscious in a very measurable pronounced way that we have no experience of smelling just give you an example uh there is a molecule called i'm just looking up don't you love organic chemistry like these names like it's like hexadecanol it's not the worst one but try to say it 10 times fast um hexadecanol Ah, a torturous little molecule that has been proven and disproven and proven again. It seems that we're finally reaching consensus. There were a few replication studies that shown that indeed hexadecanol is produced organically, naturally. So by that I mean naturally produced by babies. A very like when when you do chromatographic 
so so to speak headspace analysis behind the baby's head there is a lot of uh, kind of uh, warmth and production of scents there um, and you smell them that's again empirically almost everybody knows the smell of a baby's head delicious soothing happy well babies indeed conduct a chemical warfare on us that we cannot smell we smell them without having experience of truly smelling something so there are things that we smell on the back of the baby but there is a molecule called hexadecanol that is very dominant there i think it's like up to 30 percent of what you will smell or what will be there Actually, it's a good question. 30% of what, what, what binds to your receptor, so 30% of what they detect, what, of they detect in the air. Because some molecules need to be present in very high concentrations for us to get them through. And some molecules we smell like in even mo most minuscule concentrations. Can't answer this question. I need to look at the study. But the consensus is babies produce a lot of hexadecanol. Hexadecanol has no discernible smell, almost no, almost none. And it has statistically significant effect that da -da 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 -da, drama, drama, drama is opposite for men and for women. Can you believe this? A gender specific chemical response, scandalous nearly scandalous so what happens when a man or an average man right like we're talking about statistics an average man <laughs> smells the back of the head of an average baby their olfactive system detects hexadecanol among other things and they isolated it away from everything else so it was a controlled and very specific study that was done and not one it was specifically hexadecanol that when you, uh, when a man smells it, he uh, experiences reduction in aggression, which a lot of people think that aggression is actually our default response. And women are more complexly regulated. Again, we can argue till we're blue in the face why, but women are natively by that i mean just in population you pull several women you pull several men women are natively have much higher control over their impulses than men however and then for a lot of time there were all these arguments that women are just made differently women are just let's say not aggressive they just can't be and it seems that the beside the hexadecanal studies it emerges that at least it's a it's a viable theory that we all are very aggressive it's just women are on average are much more social and they end up as adults we don't know why but they end up much more tightly regulated with their with with how they regulate subconsciously their aggression than men women what we know they experience increase in aggression when they smell hexadecanol and I guess ecological theory behind it that it's good for the baby either way because most aggression of males is in group. So in a pedestrian language, a male is run by aggression, a man is run by aggression and he will expose people closest to him to aggression very quickly. A woman, a average statistical woman in a spherical woman in a vacuum is very highly regulated in terms of aggression and when she lowers her aggression threshold when she becomes kind of loosens up and becomes more aggressive her aggression somehow is more directed to outgroup intruders so here you can see how it truly benefits for the biology of the babies to produce as much hexagonal as as possible so that the fathers don't beat and kill them and their mothers are more alert and more ready to fight in case anybody else come into their sphere and endangers the baby. And that just a drop in an ocean. It's just one 
it's not even one case study as i told you there's like several studies involved but it's just one molecule out of many 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 that is very potently present produced by us humans for for specific relational purposes the one that depends on our olfactive system working well but the one that does not create sensation that oh i'm experiencing smell you are completely unaware that all of this is at work when it's happening i exaggerate for the entertainment purposes because the effect sizes are statistically significant but not that dramatic to say that everyone immediately will we're constantly when we're talking about studies or it is known you know university uh, sort of so and so showed researchers discovered all of that kind of talk is usually on average out of the sample of how many is it um, and then we have all these complicating factors of age location how the study was conducted what exactly did they measure because they measured aggression but I don't think they uh, they got anything on their arousal. I think they tried and they couldn't quite tease out any signal. And again, it's so many questions why was was is it that the aggression is much more direct because it's a primitive emotion we all have it, right? In a way, it's less complex and less subjective to to all those it's still subject to so many factors, but little, it's a little less convoluted and abstract then I like this person. Like I like someone or I find them attractive is such a composite phenomenon, then God knows, right? Like how one molecule plays into it. With like, like I'm willing to punch this guy. <laughs> I think this is a, just a little shorter path to study. Um, so yes, yeah, still not clear to me uh, how quickly uh, we're gonna uh, see the hex hexagecanol being marketed to us by pheromone companies and such and yet again like since it's a gender specific response i'm like i'm so amused like i'm waiting to see one of those instagram niche brands that just says like bro sense something you know you just put on to go like on a fishing trip with the guys or like get get into like gaming night or like watching football kind of nice. So you're just like, dude, I love you, bro. You're the best. And yet the same thing. Okay, if it unleashes uh, s somewhat and um, enables expression of aggression in women, that could be a really great office scent for women, especially those that are in leadership positions or those that are in high stress situations where they need to be alert and kind of go getter type when it's nearly required by their job. In order to be good at their job, they have to be more aggressive. That could be <laughs> that could be fun. Um, yeah, so let, let's see how soon we see that on the market. That said, it's only the tip of the iceberg, right? It's just a small molecule we spend half an hour discussing. There are many more, and there are many more that we don't know of. And unfortunately, we cannot call them pheromones because they affect the limbic system, but they don't make us love somebody, right? We don't, it's not as easy as smell this, you're immediately gonna like get obsessed with someone. That does not function on humans this way. And as again, I mentioned in the sort of se second section, most of the things that do kind of allude to mate selection smell uh, pretty bad. And there we're choosing our mates on the least bad <laughs> or the most diverse bad smell that, I <laughs> that I've uh, witnessed. This, this stink is not like mine. <laughs> things of that nature. Uh, which, again, if we make that whole uh, loop back, isn't that fascinating that now we constantly are biased toward pleasantry of, of sense? Like if in the perfume nation, right? Like in, the, in our community, we're constantly talking about uh, yummy, there's, there's a lot of like olfactive sciences joke, yummy, may, and yucky. And perfume industry exists almost... Um, predominantly in the yummy to me but again the me to yummy is somewhat subjective and culturally coded and yet in animal world 
And not so many centuries ago for us, in our communities, in our societies, we were all in the yucky territory. And yet we were comfortably, comfortably there, smelling each other's underpants, so to speak, in the armpits and making very important discerning decisions, including uh, about who to hook up with. That was not about smelling delicious. That was about whose stink do I find to be the most valuable today? <laughs> it's a very interesting shift of paradigm. And I wonder mm, how, how adaptive is our judgment? Remember like the first part when I told you it's a very complex sensing system that gets almost bewilderingly, dramatically reduced by the point when it gets to a brain decision processing kind of uh, mechanisms in s s sphere of that of that system fu functioning so why are we so different now and it seems like it's almost unthinkable for most people there are some i know who really really like the stink um I mean, we all know at least one person who, who could benefit from use of deodorants. But I'm sure for them, this is the most, maybe not delicious, but the most alive and the most real and authentic sensing experience that they can have. I doubt that anybody would s walk around producing so much BO, body odor, and be disgusted by it. You know what I mean? Like, we're usually not that masochistic. We're usually kind of self-opt to things that bring us some kind of comfort or stimulation. So that's an interesting discussion in itself. And I also want to know how comfortable versus uncomfortable you are with respect to uh, pleasant smells, classical realm of fragrances of all kinds and again i understand that for some something is pleasant something is mess something is not so not so pleasant but the, we all universally know what we're talking about when we're talking about scent of urine feces right the sweat or really old sweat a lot of sweat um bad breath and all uh, digestive smells uh, all, all kinds of things of that nature those very few people find attractive but surprisingly you don't have to be attracted to it to find it useful and pleasant not in the way of what you smell but pleasant in a way how real authentic and functional those smells are please let me know in the comments down below what is your tolerance level when it comes to this world right, of things that we came from and now are masking with perfumes, I would love to know. And when it comes to perfumes themselves, here things just get incredibly boring, which in itself is a surprise because there is no shortage of videos about gourmands, musks, and sort of certain florals, flor floral perfumes and spicy perfumes that we just can't get enough of them and yet they're like like watch 10 videos of this kind what's like the most complimentary slash sexy uh perfume for dating or for attracting opposite sex and you will find if not the same uh articles right like not the same perfume names but you will find the same themes gourmands florals for women something spicy aromatically woody for men it's been like this for decades now i i just we just explored the path the, the more distant past where like that was all about bo and we were not even talking about pleasantry of it all that was not on the table nobody was concerned about the pleasantry of the smell it was very functional and any of you who watched the Napoleon movie or read anything about him, like there are a number of uh, famous men in history and we have their letters and we have all this documentation that men of that era were really, really into unwashed underwear. And I mean, still a niche 
market that exists today, but now it's considered niche. And back in medieval, not even medieval, like 18th century is not medieval, guys. Uh, 17th uh, century, 18th century, it was still rather prevalent situation going on when it comes to sexiness. And now it's all about boozy vanillas, you know, gourmands, something spicy, sweet, edible. What's the point (laughs) of continuously asking that question and getting the same answer? And why is it that they are nearly the same answers? While in reality, if you actually start testing it, situation is much more complex. Yes, we all like the smell of a baked pie, right? Something vanilla. That's great. It's a non-controversial choice. And yet, when you ask that question, when you let people compare things or let them recall the stories of somebody they loved and how they smelled, it's all over the place. It's so subjectively coded in the early exposures and the experience that they remember as kids, uh, what their mom wore, what women around them or girls in school were wearing as scents. Like there's like, there's probably so so much devoted to those fruity shampoos that girls uh, wash their hair with when they were in middle and high school that every guy just will immediately react to if he smells that typical fruity shampoo uh, smell in a body mist on a woman. It's just this flirty, comfortable, easy to understand, pleasant sensation that also is linked to the early me- memories of fascination with the uh, with whatever group of people you you feel attracted to and again it's culturally coded if it's if it was a, kind of a typical cis situation a guy and a girl it was that could be a fruity shampoo or a smell of lilacs that grew nearby or or this or that and for girls it can be like I distinctly remember a girl told me that she had real trouble dating because her dad worked in a garage and then like he was a car mechanic and he was a bit of an alcoholic but he was like a, a tame one a kind one he was very kind kind of very mellow person and for her the smell of love and the smell of men was the smell of beer so the hops and this kind of bready yeasty smell and of gasoline and she just could not (laughs) remove her I mean and again other garage car garage related smells and she just could not really enjoy any she could enjoy other smells but she could not relate them to a man some people get encoded very very heavily and some much more loose in that sense sexiness is so deliciously subjective that I almost don't want to know the answer. Does that make any sense to you? Like, do you want to, like, if there was one to this day uncovered molecule, whether you can smell it or not, or you just add it to any perfume composition and just spritz yourself to death, would you want to know? Would you want to use it? Let me know in the comments down below. And with that, our little delightful ramble. I hope you managed to do your laundry, clean your dishes, drive to where you need to go. I hope that was somewhat fun, interesting, and entertaining. I don't know how educational that was, but if you want me to dive any deeper, I can. It's just, I find that in discussions of this kind, there are two types of people. Chemists and people who ask the question and it's like oh look so oh how do we smell and it's like oh okay so there are receptors and then they (laughs) immediately still searching for the right balance i hope you will help to navigate me in the right direction because i do it as much for you as i do it for my own amusement i just want us to enjoy our time together but also feel like We got something out of it. Like you had like a really light, tasty, and yet nutritious snack. That's ultimately my goal here with the Perfume Nation podcast. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope that as you are getting ready, your fingers, 
to put a like, to subscribe to this podcast, whether you're on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Amazon, where all of this is available, that you will enjoy the delicious outro song that I also created for you. And let's see each other in the next episode. Hey there, you reached the end, but don't just depart. Hit like, subscribe, it's a way to take part in support. You love it's an art. Like and subscribe, be the vibe, keep us alive. In this changing, you'll see it's how we ride. It's more than a click, it's a bridge, a connection. Each donation, a show of affection. We're in this together, seeking perfection. Like and subscribe, be the Live in this digital sea, it's how we thrive. So here's a call to one and all. Stand with us, answer the call. Let's make some waves and stand tall. Oh, yeah.